what's going on, Heartland family? You excited to be at First Wednesday this evening? Come on, I'm excited that you're here. What a wonderful time to be together, just like Rex and Stephanie were saying. And I have the honor and privilege of introducing our guest tonight. Well, he's not really a guest. He's been here several times. But uh, in fact, if you were here at the Dream Team party, you, you've met him and, and you, you've heard from him a little bit. But in case you don't know Brandon, he is just an incredible man. He is a leader of leaders. He actually has a, a ministry called Leading Second where he takes uh, people in ministry, outside of ministry, everywhere, and uh, just makes them better leaders. Come on, we all wanna be better leaders, right, everybody? I can just tell you that he has his uh, handprint, his thumbprint, on so many different local churches, nationally, internationally. He has an incredible podcast. I mean, he, he loves the local church. Isn't that awesome? And uh, I'm just so thankful for him. And, and I just wanna stand here and say that I don't think that I would be the leader that I am without Brandon in my life and his influence over me. And so, Brandon, I just want to say thank you for that. And so, Heartland Church, will you help me welcome Brandon? Can we stand to our feet and honor him today as we welcome Brandon Stewart? Good evening, church. How are you tonight? Hey, do me a favor if you would stay standing, if you would, or, or jump to your feet if you're not so good to be with family tonight you just love a good first wednesday I, this is like my favorite time of the whole month uh, any chance i get to be at one of these and uh, i have to say thank you mikey that was that was really really kind um i love this house and i know some of us don't know each other or we're just getting to know each other um but i'm a stalker of this house i've been coming around this house a long time and you never knew it pastor dan can tell you we've had many Many of Papacitos. Anyone just thank God for the work that he's doing at Papacitos here in Texas. I'm from the, I'm from the Northwest. We can't get Tex-Mex to save our life up there. So um, anyways, we've had, we've had many a chips and salsa um, and fajitas, but many a time spent together um, talking about and working on the work that God is doing here at Heartland Church. And I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that we get to be a part of this house in this season and this time for what God is doing at Heartland Church. How many of you know you are so blessed? You're so blessed to have the pastors that you have. So blessed to have the leaders that you have. Can I just say, um, get to go a lot of places in the, the work and ministry that God has allowed us to do. This is a healthy house. There, there, there's life in this house. If you're here and you're planted in this house, this is good soil to be planted. And tonight we're giving Pastor Dusty and Kendra a chance to um, rest and be away um, so that they can continue to be refreshed in all that they're doing. Um, but there's a deep bench around here. And, and there, there's so, so many of you, just such great leaders and so much health and life and faithful givers. So from the bottom of my heart, from someone who you may not know, but someone who loves this house very deeply, Thank you for giving, thank you for serving, thank you for your faithfulness, because I believe that the work that God is doing here is, is something significant, and I truly believe that the greatest days of impact with this house are still to come. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name. So, love you. Um, receive me, if you would, as, as family tonight, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And uh, we're going to have a good time tonight. Um, I ask you to stand, because I really believe in what God can do in a few minutes. Uh, tonight is certainly not going to be about anything that I say. It's certainly going to be about what he says to, to you tonight through the power of his word. And I don't have it all worked out exactly in my mind, like how this church thing works yet. But what I do know is that when we open up the word of God and we unpack its truth into our lives, things change. Yeah. And, and stories are rewritten. And captives find freedom. And there's new life and there's new hope in the word. And tonight we're going to do that. And I believe God's placed a word in my heart that if it's just for one person, God, God put it deep in my heart tonight. And I believe that um, he wants to speak. But the, the question is, are we ready to receive? He's always ready to speak. I believe he's like a farmer. He's going to scatter some seeds tonight. I just wonder if your heart's ready to receive it. So I wanted to ask you to stand because it's first Wednesday. What if we just took a minute? What if we just gave God some space and some room 
to talk to us tonight, like really talk to us tonight. I'll, I'll say this. Um, we're living in um, very, very unprecedented times right now. You see the meme recently that said, um, I miss precedented times. <laughs> what happened to precedented times? Everything's unprecedented right now. Um, we're navigating darkening culture. We're navigating um, first generation in America, having to navigate a post-Christian world. It's kind of our growing reality. This might be my Pacific Northwest talking in a historically unchurched part of the country, but I can tell you that um, things have shifted and things have changed. And yet, I just have this sneaking suspicion that God could be, that this season could like be kindling for some of the greatest work that we might see God do in our generation, in our nation, and in the world. And let's believe God's doing something in his church right now. So Father, tonight we just say we love you. Our hearts are open in this place, Lord. We came here tonight because we're serious. We came here tonight, Jesus, because we want to do business with you. We want you to speak, and we ask you to move. I ask that you would come right now by the power of your spirit, through the strength of your word, that you would stride up and down every, every aisle in this house tonight, God, and that you would talk to us, that you would, you would be a light that shines on areas that need to change. You'd be a mirror that allows us to, to, to examine ourselves tonight, Father. Come and speak. Come and talk. We just give you permission and space to do just that. And now, God, I ask that I would get out of the way so that you can have your way. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said a big amen. 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 All right, now you can take your seats. So I've, uh, I've been a part of the same local church my whole life. So 38 of my 40 years on planet Earth have found me in uh, one church, under one pastor, one vision. So it, when Mikey said, I love the local church, if you cut me, that is what I will bleed. I will bleed for God's house. I love um, the church deeply. Um, I turned 40 uh, in the past year, so I'm now old. I get to do, like, old people messages. This is great. I get to, like, talk to the young people, you know, uh, because I'm not one anymore, uh, apparently. Uh, and then this last summer, I actually just um, crossed 20 years in ministry and really excited about just, just um, I think, all that God has done, yet all that he's going to do. And then on the family side, we've actually had a really, really big year. Uh, we, first of all, had a daughter that turned uh, 10 uh, this last year, and 10 is like the new teenager. Any, any parents, like, want to agree with that right now? Like... Like, she is every bit a teenager, it feels like, and I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for a girl teenager in the house. God help us all. I don't think she's watching this tonight, so I could talk about it. Um, but then, as God would have it, right about a year ago, I flew home from a trip, and my wife um, had a gift waiting on the dining room table for me, and inside was a positive pregnancy test something we were not planning. And so after a 10-year gap, uh, we found ourselves with a surprise, but God wasn't up with the surprises um, at that point. Our daughter, she must have been so eager to get into the world, she decided to arrive 11 weeks early. Actually, six months ago today, today is her six-month birthday. And so we have a picture to show. This is our second baby glow on her uh, on her birthday. She was all of about three pounds, eight ounces, which I came to find out is actually a big NICU baby. Uh, she spent 51 days in the NICU. Um, honestly, some of the most trying days of our faith, especially in those early days. Um, it's hard to get a scale there for, for size and all that, but uh, 51 days later, we can go to the next picture. 51 days later, we left uh, the NICU and uh, we brought her home, and today she is healthy and strong, not a health concern we can think of. Uh, God has been so faithful, and that is my family now. Um, that's actually the day we brought her home. And then my last question is, why in the world did we get a dog? <laughs> Anybody else get a COVID dog? That's a COVID, that is a COVID mistake right up there. Actually, she's great. She's awesome. But I don't know what we were all thinking when we were all shut up for a few weeks and thought the world was ending. So we got a dog. Praise God. All right. <laughs> hey, tonight, uh, turning your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. 
Um, everything in our culture right now seems to be fascinated with the new. Lines out the door at the mall for the new iPhone when it released a couple weeks ago. Entire weekends reserved toward binge watching your favorite new series when it drops on Netflix. Some of you won't even remember the days where we actually had to wait a week in between each episode, you know, back in, back in the day. New music released by your favorite artist goes right to the top of your Spotify or to the top of your Apple Music. We, we are obsessed with the new. We, our culture um, obsesses about the new. We like the new. And I think it's because we add up that the new is better than the old. Don't we do that? We, we, we add up in our minds that, that new is better. New is faster. New is sexier. New makes my life better easier. Our, our culture is at work overtime right now, making all things new. It feels like we live in such an instant generation right now, don't we? Um, everything is instant. Everything is convenient. Now the new thing is everything is contactless. You know, if I'm hungry, I don't have to go home and stop by the grocery store on the way and go home and actually know how to cook anything. If I'm hungry, all I have to do is get my phone out and get on an app, and I can have hot Thai food to my house in like 30 minutes. Somebody thank God for the work he's doing at Uber Eats, and I don't have to even know how to cook anything, and I can eat, eat whatever I want. If I want to, I don't have to go to the store anymore, because uh, someone will now do your grocery shopping for you at Instacart. God bless them. Or the Target pickup lane. Anyone mad at their spouse for how much they spend because of how easy it is to shop at Target, you know, and then you just drive up and this person puts everything in your car. I make it a point tonight. Our culture is kind of making all things new right now. We like the new. We obsess about the new. Heck, if I want a relationship, I don't even have to go through the hard work of meeting someone anymore. All I got to do is open up an app Come on, some of you know a little bit about that, I would assume. <laughs> my, my marriage predates uh, social media. So I had to look up some of the, the apps uh, that have been created around relationships. Uh, Tinder. So I, some people are doing some deleting, I think, on their phone right now. The spirit, the spirit of app deletion just came over the, the house tonight. Tinder. These are real names. Tinder. Coffee meets bagel. Friends with benefits. We know what happens there. Uh, how about we? Bumble, Happen, Hinge, Match, OK Cupid, Down. The point is, we've, we've even found new ways to have relationships. They say that millennials will spend up to 40% more for a product if they can get it faster. Up to 40% more just to get it faster. What, what am I saying? We've we're living in a day that is obsessed with the new. We add up that new is better than old. But I want to make a case for us tonight for just a minute. That if we're going to live the lives that God has called us to live, maybe more importantly, if we're going to build the kind of church that I believe uh, brings heaven to earth, the kind of church that can really see a community transformed by the gospel, because how many of you know the stakes have never been higher for the local church, that God needs healthy, thriving local churches in every community of our nation right now. The, the time has never been more important for that to happen. But I believe if we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, I believe there are some things that we are going to need to get back to. This is kind of my case for you tonight. If there are some things as the church that it's time to we return to and we get back to. You know, I am more proud than ever to be a Christ follower. I am more proud than ever to be a church builder. We live in a day where I know those statements are not always the most popular right now. And even making those statements, especially in certain parts of the country, you have to be willing to kind of go against the grain a bit and take a stand. 
It's not a popular time to promote a biblical worldview, in other words. It's not a popular time to be a church-going, faithful believer. You know, we can elect whoever we want, and we, get, we live in a democracy, and we're free to do that. But at the end of the day, Jesus stands as king, and Jesus is the hope of the world. And the gospel is what will truly bring change and hope to our communities that people are desperately grasping for right now. You know, in the church, we have it. We have the hope that the world is, is looking for. If we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, I believe there are some things that we need to get back to. So tonight, I want to call us higher for a few minutes. I want to call us deeper into some things. And if you're looking for a title, here's your title tonight. I'm going to call us to redig the wells. Redig the wells. And I want to read to you an incredible passage in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 18 tonight in the New American Standard. It says this, then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Moses, after, I'm sorry, after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the same names which his father had given them. Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father. And then see it at the end there. He gave them the same names which his father had given them. So a little bit of context here for us tonight. Isaac is one of the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, of our faith, of course. Uh, you have Abraham, you have Isaac, and you have Jacob. And um, at this time, Isaac is leading. There, there's very little real estate in the Bible, by the way, dedicated to Isaac. Abraham has quite a chunk. Uh, Jacob, Israel, has quite a chunk. But, but Isaac, there's only a couple chapters where we see him leading, and this is one of those instances. And what had happened here is during the time of his father Abraham, the nation of Israel under Abraham's leadership had found themselves uh, displaced from, from the land God had given them and promised them. And they found themselves living in the land of the Philistines. Now, these were not the Goliath Philistines that we might think of, the more warlike Philistines that uh, we, we hear of later in Scripture. These were a little bit more of a peaceful, treaty-making Philistine. But when you see the word Philistine, here's what I want you to think. These were, the Philistines were simply people who weren't God's people, okay? And they had values that weren't God's values or a culture that wasn't God's culture. That, that we can kind of take that to the Philistines to mean that in this passage here. So Abraham, because they were living in a time of famine and they were living in a time of need, they found themselves displaced, God's people, Israel, living in the land of the Philistines. Well, a generation later, Isaac finds himself in the same place. There's famine, there's need, and so Isaac and God's people, Israel, are back living in the land of the Philistines. In other words, God's people are living in a land that was not their land, in a culture that was not their culture, among people that were not their people. Well, when Abraham's generation had been there, one of their first things they had done is they had dug wells. Because how many of you know, when you live in a desert, water is important? <laughs> And so their generation had dug wells. But in the time of their absence, while they were away from the land of the Philistines, the Philistines had filled in the wells. They had filled in the wells with garbage, with debris, with trash, earth. And I find it really interesting that when Isaac's generation returns to this land, they sort of made a treaty with the Philistines, and it was their season to be in this land, one of their first acts in returning to this land was to redig the wells of their fathers. In other words, they went back to the wells, they removed the trash and earth, 
and debris that were in the wells to regain access to the source of water. And then I find it really interesting. It says this, they gave them the same names that their forefathers had given them. You know, water in Scripture is very significant. Not only is it significant when you live in a desert, of course, but actually in the New Testament, Jesus himself is referred to as living water. John chapter 4 and verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. John chapter 7, verse 38, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his inner, innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So not only is Jesus living water, but I believe we as his people are positioned to be carriers of the living water of Jesus to a world that desperately needs a drink right now. That's really, I think, a, a simple picture of God's plan for your life is simply to carry the living water of Jesus to a world that desperately needs him. In other words, I believe your life, my life as believers, we're called to be deep wells. We're called to be wells that are constantly accessing the living water of Jesus. I want when people encounter me, I want them to encounter life, not because I'm so cool and good looking, which we all know that I am, but because of Jesus working and flowing through me. That when people encounter me, they encounter the living water of Jesus. I wonder if that same picture could be applied to this church. You know, every single weekend in church life, every single weekend, we have people walk through these doors who desperately need a drink from Jesus. They may not even know it, but people walk into this house in, in all conditions of life. People walk in very aware of where life is tough, very aware of where they've messed up, very aware of where things feel heavy, especially at a season that we're living in right now. And I believe one of the greatest pictures of the church is that when people come into the doors on a Sunday morning, when they come into the house, that they would actually find a deep well right here in the house, the living water of Jesus that they can access when they desperately need him. But I'll be honest with you. I get a chance to, to work with churches, you know, coast to coast, North America and it's, it's the great privilege and honor of our lives to get to do it. Um, but if I'm honest with you, Harlan Church, when I look around the local church in North America right now, if I'm honest with you, I feel like I'm seeing a lot of stopped up wells. I feel like we're living in a season where God's people are living in a land that is not their land and a culture that's not their culture. And I actually feel like I've seen this verse come to life. I feel like I'm seeing a lot of stopped up wells. A lot of believers whose lives are designed to be wells accessing the living water of Jesus yet are filled in with a lot of garbage, with a lot of debris, with a lot of values that are not our values, culture that is not our culture, ways that are not our ways. And I believe if we're going to be offer Jesus to a world that desperately needs to see him, I believe it's time for us as God's people to redig the wells. In a, in a culture that is obsessed with the new, I believe there are some things as God's people we need to get back to. There are some things that we need to get back to and, and, and not just get back to. I believe there are some wells we need to redig in our lives and not just dig them and uh, redig them and give them some trendy new names. No, no, no. We need to redig them and we need to give them the same names that our forefathers gave them. We need to get back to some things in the church in this hour and this day. In fact, I, I did a little list recently. Like, what could this look like for us as God's people to redig the wells? I don't know if we had a chance to put any of these on the screen, but like, I thought of the well of prayer. I, I've been in seasons in my life where the well of prayer was stopped up. 
in my life. But I know that when I have a habit of regular prayer, when that well is free of debris, when that well is flowing, I access the power of God, the living water of Jesus in my world, in my life. Just look at these right now. Look at, look at these wells. The well of worship, the well of reading the Bible, the well of fasting. We can skip that one if you want. That's fine. Uh, the, the, well, the well of holiness. Here's one, the well of forgiveness and reconciliation. We're actually called, the Bible says, to the ministry of reconciliation. In a day where it feels like everyone is at each other's throats. You know, anyone been in the comments section recently on your Facebook? You know, like, stay out of that place right now. That's not a good place. Like, like. How many of you know those are the moments where we as God's people are called to carry Jesus the, through the ministry of reconciliation to a world that desperately needs to see him? But if I'm honest with you, I've gotten in some Facebook comment threads where I know that well got stopped up in my life, where it became for me more about winning the argument than winning the neighbor. And I believe it's time we need to get back to some things. How about the well, um, the well of the Sabbath? The well of serving, honor. You just, this was just my list. I'm sure there could be many more. Come on, when you see this, would you agree there are some things in the church that might be a little stopped up right now? Because we're living in a culture that's not necessarily our culture anymore. In fact, I believe it is the great privilege of our generation we're going to need to learn as, Christ, as God's people, as Christ followers, how to actually stand for Christ and live for Christ in a culture that doesn't always represent Christ. I actually believe that's the assignment on our generation, to learn how to stand like Daniel in Babylon, to learn how to be in the world but not of the world, to learn how to take a stand for Christ, to represent Christ in a world that truly needs to see him but doesn't always want to look at him. But I believe it will only happen when we redig the wells. I wonder what wells are stopped up in your life tonight. This is what I've been asking myself. When God paused our ministry last year during COVID, when God paused our ministry again in our family situation this spring, having a premature baby, I mean, when I've been paused over the last 18 months, this is where my prayer life has gone. God, what wells in my life are stopped up right now? What's the new work you want to do in me, Lord? What place do you want living water to flow through me in a fresh new way? I believe if you'll ask the Holy Spirit, I believe he'll reveal things because there, I believe for every single person in this room, there's a new work that God wants to do in and through your life if you'll give him the space to redig the wells. So I came with a couple wells that I've been thinking of recently. Can we just talk about a couple before we go tonight? I have a couple wells that I think are particularly important right now. If we're really going to honor God and live for God in this season, let's talk about a couple. First of all, I believe one well that I see really stopped up that I believe God wants to do a fresh work in is the well of being planted in the church. The well... I know this isn't a really sexy message tonight, guys. But remember, I'm an old person. I get to give old people messages now. I didn't come to impress you. You know, some speakers, by the way, some speakers are like, um, like, like the entree at, at church. You know, it's like really good steak. It's, it's good chicken. You know, it's really, it's good lasagna. It's like a good meal. Uh, some speakers, hands down, are great dessert. Like, 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 it'll get you excited. It tastes really good. It's awesome. I am often feel like I have the anointing of vegetables on my life. Um, I may not impress you and I may not taste good, but I'm giving you something you really need to hear tonight, I believe. So tonight's just a little bit of greens maybe for, for all of us. <laughs> the well of being planted in church, Psalm 92, 13 says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. 
they shall still be bear fruit in old age. Even when they're 40, they will still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing, planted in the house of the Lord. So we're living in the day of what is being coined, you might have seen it, what is being coined as the great resignation. The great resignation. Pastor Dusty and I walked into a restaurant recently. It was absolutely empty, other than about three tables full that we could see. And uh, we were put on a 10-minute wait list. <laughs> Not because there wasn't tables, because no one was present to serve in the restaurant. Yeah. Didn't have enough workers. This is happening everywhere right now. And the great resignation, we're, we're, we're struggling to fill job opportunities, where we're, people are engaging less in environments like work and even church. We're seeing this happen in the church right now. We're seeing volunteer teams that, that are smaller than they used to be. We're, we're, we're seeing serving to your dream team that, that, that are feeling this right now. But I believe the culprit is that this is a well that got filled in in our lives. When we all sat at home for a few weeks or a few months last year and we went to church online, and not you, you're here at First Wednesday. It's like I'm not even talking to the right people about this one tonight because you're actually here, not even on a Sunday, you're here on a Wednesday. God bless you. So I'm preaching to the choir tonight. But I think we got into this mode where like, it's like, I'm good. I don't need to go to church on Sunday. I'm good. I can sit here and stir my oatmeal and make my Nespresso on my coffee machine at home and watch pajamas. You know, you watch church in my pajamas. Like, I'm good. I don't need that. The problem is, for those that didn't quickly re-engage after that season, and thank God our churches went online. Thank you to the whole team that made that season happen, that works tirelessly and diligently, that's still tonight. And, and by the way, no condemnation for anyone watching online tonight. Maybe there's even someone watching right now. No condemnation. But I think something happened. Those that didn't quickly re-engage when the opportunity allowed itself, the well started to get filled in. Yep. Of like, I, don't, I, can, I can worship at home. I can read the word on my own. I have a couple friends, I'm good. The debris that filled in this well was the debris, I believe, of self-authority. Self-authority. I'm good. Because when you're planted in the house, when you're planted under a pastor, you know what you do is you lose a little bit of your own authority because you actually submit yourself to godly authority. And you submit yourself to other believers. And your life is not your own anymore because you're a part of something a whole lot bigger than you. The church, by the way, I think the church is the greatest thing happening on planet Earth. Not only is it the hope of the world, it is the light of the world, it is the vehicle that Jesus is using to bring salvation to the earth. I'm firmly convinced of that. But what happens to the believer in the local church is phenomenal. You get around brothers and sisters in Christ who are exactly that. They are brothers and sisters. They drive you crazy sometimes. They're annoying sometimes. They rub you the wrong way sometimes. But guess what? That's exactly what your faith life needs to get a little bit sharper and a little bit deeper. You need the family of God in your corner submitted to something bigger than you. So being planted, I, I will say one of the greatest things in my life, well, I've done a lot wrong, but one of the best decisions I've ever made was to be planted in the local church and to be firm in that commitment. Like, if the doors are open, we are there. I, am, I have just committed. I am unshakable. I am unmovable. God's house is my home. And I can tell you that almost four decades of simply showing up, even when I didn't feel like it, four decades of, of signing up to serve, and now my whole family doing it together, it has built something into our lives. It has built something into our family. And I believe if you're at that place tonight, maybe you're even fresh back tonight, from a, a time, an absence. Man, maybe it's time for you to redig that well 
and discover again the beauty of the community of the local church, what it means to be a part of something bigger than you. I believe this is a well that we need to redig. And you know what? No condemnation. Because what you're going to see is over the next months, maybe even years, you're going to see people coming back. They were here once, and they're just coming back. And I pray, Heartland Church, I pray when people return, that they don't get the spirit of the older brother, you know, in the, in the parable. They don't get the, the, the older brother wondering where they were, mad at them where they were. I pray they get the heart of the Father through us, just saying, welcome home. We're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're back. Welcome back to the family. Redig the well of being planted in the church. I will say, I got to be here about a month ago, and I love the work God is doing in Pastor Dusty and Kendra right now. It's been so rewarding. I got to be here the night they were installed, and I guess now we're about two years later. By the way, the first two years of your pastoring life being COVID, can we just say you have some pretty phenomenal pastors? (laughs) Uh, to that be the first couple of years. and But when he started teaching that Sunday morning a couple months ago, I just thought he's just stepped into a new season and a new authority. And I want you to know um, he has a pastor's heart towards you. He cares for all of you so deeply. He loves you. They take their job seriously. This is a good house to be a part of, being planted in the local church. Okay, number two. I believe one of the wells that we really need to redig right now in this season is the well of guarding our hearts. Guarding our hearts. Um, gosh, I got so much I can say about this one tonight. Time's going to run out. The greatest six hours of all of our lives recently happened on Monday when Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp went down. <laughs> can somebody say Amen. All of a sudden, we remembered what life was like before social media. Gen Z was horrified because they had no idea what life was like before social media. (laughs) But I will tell you, and I'm I'm joking, I, I am a firm believer in the positive use of social media. But can we all admit right now, we live in a day where we have a lot coming at us. We have a lot of information coming at us. We have a lot of opinion. We live in the day of elevated opinion, by the way. Opinion is the new fact now, and it's so dangerous. It just seems old school to say, guard your heart. But I believe it's exactly the posture of a believer in this season. Third John and two said, beloved, I pray that in all respects, you may prosper And be in good health just as your soul prospers. Just as your soul prospers. I guess I'm wondering, um, how's your soul tonight? Are you taking care of your soul in this season? We've got a lot of arguments coming our way. We've got a lot of opinions coming our way. We're facing really tough stuff right now. But I believe if you will set up the security systems of your heart. To get here this morning, I had to pass through security at the airport. I had to get my bags scanned, and I got scanned. I had to make sure there was nothing going to get on that plane that didn't belong on the plane for the safety and the health of everybody on the plane. I just wonder if you've done that for your heart. I wonder if you've set up time and space for the Holy Spirit to talk to you about what's come into your heart. Time and space for the Holy Spirit to take some things out that don't belong in your heart. The danger of not guarding your heart, if your heart is constantly stressed, your heart is constantly exposed, and has to constantly be in a fight stance, what you can develop is a hardened heart. Or a heart that is often exposed to sin and temptation and st- weight, as the Bible calls it in Hebrews 12. The stuff that doesn't belong in your life, you can actually develop a seared heart. Yeah. Wow. And both of those things take us out of the posture, I believe, that we're called to have as believers, which would be a soft heart. Yeah. 
Like, I know sometimes we have to stand for our faith and fight for our faith, but I pray we always have a soft heart toward people, toward the work that God wants to do in their lives. We're living in a day with a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. Um, the toll that this season has had has been great. I believe that's, that's maybe the, one of the true pandemics of this season is, is isolation and anxiety and fear and depression and mental health. And it's serious and it's real. But I believe as God's people, we can offer hope to a world that desperately needs it. But first, I believe that's a well that needs to be free flowing in our life right now, that, that we have a, a thick skin and a soft heart, that we have guarded our hearts long enough where we have preserved the work that God wants to do in our heart. Proverbs 4 and 23 says, watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. I'm going to close in just a minute. Jordan and team can come. I'm going to be honest with you. I've, um, I've started setting up some really strong guards in my heart. Just last night, I pushed the unfriend button toward an actual friend on social media. I had to. I'm not going to treat this person any differently in person. I'm not going to. But this person was becoming very toxic toward my soul and toward my faith. This person is very anti-Christ right now, and they're being vocal about it, and I had to set up a guard. It was a really hard button to push. I, ha I hated doing it, and I, I committed to pray for them. I committed to bring them before the Lord, but I had to set up a guard. Like, there are some exits that have had to happen in our lives in this season in order to preserve the work that God is doing in us, and I just want to give you permission and space to guard your heart with all diligence to watch what's coming in. Because the enemy wants to traffic in lies and falsehoods into your heart. He wants to traffic in things, seeds, that seem so innocent, but have a potential to grow the wrong harvest in your life. Debris that gets filled in from the free-flowing well of living water of Jesus flowing through you. Do you receive this tonight, by the way? Is this okay? Are we okay with vegetables tonight? <laughs> I got one more well, and it's just a simple one. Maybe the most important in this season is I believe um, we need to redig the well of the Holy Spirit. The well of the Holy Spirit. You can live your life every day empowered by the Holy Spirit. Do you know that in everything you face, that you're not alone? That not only do we have Jesus, our advocate, our high priest. You know, he's, you've not faced anything in life Jesus didn't face. He faced it all, yet he was without sin. And so he knows. Whatever feels heavy to you, he knows. He faced it. He's been there. Hell doesn't have keys to their own house right now because Jesus holds the keys. <laughs> he, he's been there. He, he's walked it. And he said that, and he promised us he would send to us a counselor, a helper, an advocate, a friend, the Holy Spirit, to empower you and ignite his purpose and his life in you every single day. And I pray in this season that you're accessing the power. My, my pastors years ago, it's so funny, we would teach on this in a discipleship class. And Pastor Sheila, my pastor's wife, would always say, you wouldn't go to use a vacuum cleaner without plugging it into the wall, you know. That was our big saying back in the day to teach on the Holy Spirit, you know. Um, but it's true. But I think a lot of believers right now in this season feel like, those vacuum cleaners not plugged into the wall. It's like we're trying to do something, but there's no power there. There's no life there. Whatever you're facing, Jesus knows, and he has sent you a helper through the Holy Spirit. And I believe if you'll wake up every morning and you'll live your life with an open posture and you'll have a regular rhythm of, of going before God and spending time with God and 
Not just praying and bringing him your needs, but asking him to fill you with power, to baptize you afresh in the spirit. I believe he will meet you every single day. And we're not going to escape the culture we're in right now. We're here in this moment. We're in the land of the Philistines, so to speak. This is our assignment right now as God's people. I think what I'm trying to say tonight is we don't need to face it alone. We have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. Can you imagine not knowing Jesus in this season? Can you imagine? Can you imagine having to face what we have faced? I mean, I know it's been tough for us, but we know Jesus. May that thought forever break our hearts for the world waiting right outside these doors that desperately needs Jesus. Come on, church, let's just make commitments tonight. Let's redig some wells so that we can carry the living water of Jesus to a world that desperately, desperately needs him. Amen. Would you stand to your feet with me tonight all over the room? I just wonder, with no one leaving and no one moving, I just wonder if we could give the Holy Spirit a moment. I wonder if we could give him some space. I wonder if we could ask the Holy Spirit to come and illuminate, even convict us of wells that it's time for us to redig in our hearts. Anyone that, in the room that would, would you join me? Would you maybe just lift your hands up in the air, put yourself in kind of a receiving posture right now? Holy Spirit, tonight I pray you would come. I pray that you would meet with us right now. I pray, Father, for every heart and every life that feels empty, that feels dry. Holy Spirit, would you pour out your love on them tonight? Would you pour out your presence on them tonight? Would you fill us to overflowing with the living water of Jesus? That we can carry Jesus to a world that desperately needs to see him. Father, if there's any wells in our lives that have been filled in with junk, debris, values, culture, from our surrounding culture right now. God, would you show us? Holy Spirit, what's the area you want to do a new work in us tonight? What's the place that you want? What's the space you're asking us for? And we just make commitments all over this room tonight. We're gonna give it to you. We're gonna, we're gonna be diligent leaving this room tonight. We're gonna redig the wells. Just like Isaac did. They redug the wells and they gave them the same names. They went back to some things. God, we make those commitments tonight. We're going to get back to things you want to get. If, if, it, if it's prayer, God, we commit tonight. We're going to redig the well of prayer in our lives. If it's the well of serving, maybe we've been absent from the team. God, we just commit tonight. That's a, that's a well we're going to redig right now in this season. If it's the well of faith, just believing the God of the impossible to do the impossible. God, we just commit. We're going to redig that well tonight. And I pray, Jesus, that as we make these commitments, I pray that you would raise up Heartland Church as light in the darkness, as a city on a hill. Jesus, you are the light, and yet I pray that you would shine through this house like never before. Come on, church, would you join me? Can we just pray for your church right now? God, I pray that in this hour and in this day, you would raise up this house, Father, to be a beacon of hope. Father, a statement of truth to a world that desperately needs to, know, needs to know true north, that desperately needs to know Jesus. Father, establish your kingdom here on earth through this house. Bring heaven to earth through this house, we pray. Father, let no division come into this house in the name of Jesus. Let nothing enter this house that would divide us or separate us, Father. Regardless of our political persuasion, regardless of our ideology, Father, we submit all that to the feet of King Jesus tonight. And I ask, Father, this would be a house united tonight. I ask this would be a house on mission and on purpose for this hour, for such a time as this, God. Do a work in this community and see us as available tonight, God. We're here. We're yours. We give you our hearts, we give you our church, we give you our life tonight in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, all of First Wednesday said a big amen. Amen. Love you, church. Thanks so much for time. Come on, can we give it up a little bit louder for Brandon Stewart tonight?
How about one more time for Jesus? He, he, he's the real hero, the real superstar. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. And um, what an incredible, impactful message. Thank you so much, Brandon. What got me was thinking about all those people who are having to go through all of these things that we're going through, but without the hope that we have in Jesus. And uh, I just can't... Vegetables, vegetables, vegetables. So thank you for that cauliflower tonight, Brandon. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us here on First Wednesday. It's been a blessing being able to worship together. Uh, at this time, you guys are dismissed, and we will see you on Sunday. All right? Love y'all.